customers, get them out of the way. Um, my name is Paul James. I'm an engineer with uh, Lockheed Martin. Uh, you'll notice my name's not on these charts. Uh, there's a whole long story about this, about how these charts came together, how the presentation came together. I won't bore you with most of it. Uh, basically, when I when I put in for the the speaking spot, uh, we were in the process of myself and Jeff McConnell, who's another engineer on the program, uh, and Dan Keenan, who's one of our test pilots, who's also an engineer on, on his own. Uh, we're in the middle of about six months of writing a paper uh, for the, which was going to be one of 18 F-35 related papers we presented at the AAAA conference uh, last month in Atlanta. So it turns out 17 of those 18 papers got approved for public release. One of them did not. So you can kind of guess which one it was not. And it was right at the you know, last moment. Uh, so a lot of work didn't go anywhere. Uh, they did say we could go ahead and make charts and, and dog, dogs to call sign for the pilot. So that's, when I say dog, I mean Dan. Um, they did clear us to go ahead and, and make charts, and those finally got approved two days before the conference. So I've got those charts. They don't have as much detail as I was hoping when I originally scheduled this. Um, and they're all, they were made for like a 25 minute session. So what I did was, we're gonna go through those charts second. What I'm gonna do is go through these charts first. So um, Dan and Jeff made these, uh, these are from 2015. They'd already been cleared for release, so I didn't have to go through any more hassle with that. Um, so these charts, the first deck, these are really more about NDI uh, and mostly the, the general process of what that means. Uh, it's really a low angle attack paper. It's an NDI paper with a little bit of high alpha. The second deck we'll get to is really the high alpha stuff with a little bit of NDI. They, they kind of pulled out most of the, the, the stuff that I had to do with NDI to make it work high alpha. It's still pretty, there's still some hopefully interesting stuff as far as, far as the high alpha stuff. But I want to do is not, these charts could probably take a couple hours this first day. So I'm going to go through them kind of quick. I've got some notes. Uh, so if I'm looking over here, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to just kind of pick out the high alpha because uh, I definitely want to have time to go through the high alpha charts and then get time for questions. Uh, if we get done real early, which I don't think will happen, I can come back and kind of pick up. So it's going to be a little, little out of whack. Um, so my history, uh, I graduated at University of Kansas with Aerospace Engineering in 1987. Uh, I think graduation was May 25th. June 3rd, I was started, was my first day at General Dynamics Fort Worth. Uh, and I've been there in Fort Worth for 31 years now. Of course, it was GD at first, then Lockheed, then Lockheed Martin. Uh, I hired into the F-16 program. Uh, we were still, it was pretty much in higher production, or just at the beginning. When I hired in the, the control laws and system laws were coming in, they were converting from the original analog computers to the digital. So I got involved in that uh, a little bit. I was able to make, uh, to contribute some actual design changes toward the end of the, about the five years I was in that program. From there, I went to uh, F-22, which was in the early 90s. Again, after the YM program, so I wasn't involved in the prototype at all. Uh, and so I, I brought it through most of the high output control all work for the F-22. And then at 05, when F-22 was winding down, and uh, F-35, we'd already won the contract, so again, I wasn't involved in the prototype. Uh, but I came on to F-35 in, in 2005, uh, and kind of took on a lot of the same responsibilities, a lot of the departure resistance stuff a lot of the high alpha design stuff. Um, so before we go any further, uh, I don't want to make any assumptions. I know when I say control laws, I assume most of you kind of have a general idea of what that means or you're going to be here. I thought I'd real quickly, and again, I don't want to waste time, but I'd kind of explain what that is, just to kind of give everyone a common starting point. Uh, and I thought maybe just talking in terms of some basic definitions. So when we talk about flight control system, that's really the entire beginning to end of how you control the airplane. The right flyer had a flight control system, right? It was, it was a stick, cables, push pulleys, whatever, warp the wing, move the rudder. So basically every airplane that's ever flown has a flight control system. That just means the generic system that changes the flow of the wings, the tail, whatever, so that the pilot can actually control the, the, the airplane. Um, you'll hear a fly-by-wire. You know, F-16 was kind of the first real production aircraft that was fly-by-wire. Fly-by-wire is just a form of a flight control system. Uh, specifically what we did on F-16, what they did was they took out, you probably know this, they took out all the mechanical connections between the pilot controls and the surfaces, the actuators, I mean the, the control surfaces. Replace that with a joystick, call it a joystick, the side stick, that generates an electric signal that goes into a computer. 
computer then sends signal, electrical command signals to all the actuators. The actuators have their own individual uh, hydraulic motors or, or electric motors or whatever. Um, so again, the point is there's no physical connection between the pilot and the control services. That's what we call fly-by-wire. Now the third term is stability augmentation. Stability augmentation is basically a, another generic function of a flight control system. And basically that, that means we take information from the airplane, typically roll rate, pitch rate, G's, whatever, and we feed that into the flight control system in a way that it interrupts, it inserts itself between the pilot and the control system in some manner. Now you don't have to have fly-by-wire to have stability augmentation. We've been putting stability augmentation systems on airplanes probably since the 40s or 50s. Um, usually it's been, they've been used to um, improve nagging characteristics of an airplane. So you have an airplane that's totally flyable by the pilot, it's not unstable, but it has some, un like, like a fugoid, fugoid characteristic or something that's annoying or it doesn't respond to gusts well. So we use feedback from the airplane, from the rate, from the gyroscopes, uh, attitudes or whatever, and it kind of inserts itself into the system, basically moves the control system without the pilot actually having to do that. So that's basic to the organization, and it goes all the way from minor inputs to, again, F-16, what we call full authority. So on the F-16, when, when the pilot commands goes into the computer, it enters the control law, and that's really where I'm trying to get to. So you have a, think of a black box, you've got the pilot inputs coming in, you've got all the information from the airplane, uh, rates, angle attack, all that goes into this black box. On the outside of the black box comes uh, commands that go to all the individual services. Everything that's inside the black box is the control law. It's all the algorithm, it's all the logic, it's all the gains that, that makes those connections between the inputs and the actual commands to the flight control system. So, is that clear? Okay, clear on. Okay. Um, again, I'm trying to get this, do these quick so we can have time for the questions at the end. But if I really do go off and leave you so you really are completely lost, please throw up your hand and I'll kind of try to rephrase stuff. One of the problems with doing something for 31 years is it's, it kind of becomes so natural, it's, it's easy to kind of talk over things. Okay, so with that being said, uh, why NDI? And NDI is, stands for Nonlinear Dynamic Conversion, which is just a form of flight control law development. We can't really address why until I explain what it is. Uh, so here's the three F-35s. Uh, so we have, uh, there's three different variants, so it's the same basic airframe with different variants for the Air Force, Navy, and Marines. Um, and we were tasked with designing basically all the control laws for all three airplanes basically at the same time, a little bit overlap. Um, but it's, it's not as easy, you, you couldn't just take one system, stick it in all three airplanes. So we really were designing three separate systems. Uh, and NDI wound up to be very uh, advantageous for that. Um, we desired there are three different brands, but they should all fly the same. Basically, if you're a pilot, if you're a Navy pilot in the C model, and you find yourself in an A model, it ought to feel very comfortable to fly, and, and with the B as well. Uh, the other big difference on this airplane versus like an F-22, which has a primary mission of air to air, uh, the F-35 is tasked with carrying a lot of stuff to attack for an area ground. So this is kind of a sample of the different stores, weapons, uh, some tanks, whatever, that they're going to prepare, both internally and externally. So what happens is, and it says, you see it says wide range of CG and external configuration. So we have to account in the control off for the CG location. Uh, the CG travel on this airplane is crazy ridiculous compared to an F-22. Uh, I don't think it's on the next bullet, but one thing is it carries a lot of fuel. This thing is designed to go relatively a long way, so basically they stuck fuel in every little cubby they could find, which is fine, except as the as that fuel moves, it moves the CG all over the place. Uh, now it does a pretty good job of automatically uh, transferring from tanks to kind of keep the CG in a range, but if you, for instance, if you just come off the tanker and the entire system is full, you can't move it around. Similarly, if you get toward the end, when you're about out of fuel and you don't have a whole lot of gas in the tanks, moving around doesn't do much good. So those are kind of the extremes. Um, and again, NDI really is a good system to use to, to, to handle that. Um, lots of effectors. Effectors are basically a fancy word for 
control surface of devices. The reason we say it's defective is because of the, the B model, which I'll get to. Um, so the A variant on the left, you can see my mouse there, um, very F16-like in its configuration. Uh, leading edge flaps, uh, single roll control devices on the wing to the trailing edge flaps. F16 we call it flaperons, kind of unofficially or officially. We don't really call flaperons in this program, although that's basically what they are. Uh, rudders, horizontal tails, again, all moving horizontal tails like every other basic supersonic aircraft. Um, so these do move completely. On the C variant, the wing is bigger, you can see, and we add ailerons. So this has both flaperons and ailerons, so it's basically 10 control surfaces. Um, for the B variant, which is a replacement for the Harrier, so it's tasked, it's a stove that's short, short takeoff vertical landing. Uh, it's not a requirement to take off vertically with a full load. Uh, but there's a requirement to have a very short takeoff run. So what they did on this, the B variant, there's this big lift fan that runs on a shaft that comes from the motor uh, to provide a thrust downward from there. And the, uh, the exhaust nozzle actually is on a rotor, so it's, it's basically uh, a thrust factor. So it rotates down, you get left air bowling through the lift fan to lift when you're, when you're at zero RGB or low RGB. There's also, there's also roll, roll nozzles that they shoot the uh, exhaust basically out through the wings uh, for, for roll control and FO. So this was probably, of the three, these two really could have been designed with a classical flight control system very easily. This, one, this airplane as well, if you are either purely in stowable mode, so you're in the hover, or if you're in cruise mode and all the things are buttoned up. Really the, the tricky solution becomes in the transition. When you're halfway, when you're accelerating out and you're halfway, uh, what we call jet worn, um, so it's the lift fan and the nozzle that are lifting you, but you're starting to lift over the wing, so you're also airborne. So that, you have a lot of different effectors uh, for an engineer, designer to kind of pre-program how to use those best uh, is a challenge, and it actually works out, NDI works really well for solving the best solution using all those different effectors. Okay, so, in order to understand NDI, let me check the time. Okay, I think we're right. Um, in order to understand how NDI is different than legacy, uh, what Dog did when he made these charts was he kind of had an example of how a legacy design work, process worked. Uh, and what he did was he took out a very small function, a very small part of the overall control off, and kind of walked us through that and, and used that as an example, and then contrasted that with an NDI design. So what he chose was the roll axis which is typically uh, one of the easier axes to explain. So of course the, the far outer loop, over here we have the airplane. Um, so right now, there's no, there's no sensor feedback at this level. Basically it's just the pilot. So the pilot feels the rates, he feels the attitude, and he, he adjusts for whatever he wants to do uh, through the side stick. The side stick comes into a call gradient. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but the, the output of that is a desired roll rate. So it's a little different than flying. Uh, I'm used to Bonanza. My brother flew me here in, in, in his Bonanza. So my conventional airplane would be a Bonanza. And Bonanza, when you, you turn the stick or roll the, the wheel, you're commanding a certain halo on deflection. When the F-35 or F-16 or F-32 pilot moves the stick, it's actually commanding a specific roll rate. It's a little bit of a subtle difference, but it does, does make a difference downstream. Um, so at that point, he's asking for a certain roll rate in degrees per second. And then what we do, and this is where the stability augmentation system kind of becomes real. So we have brake gyros, or laser run gyros, or whatever it is on the airplane. The sense is what the actual roll rate of the airplane is. And, and this K, oh, it was in the mouse. Um, so the little K there, that's, we'll talk more about that. That's a game. That's a schedule. Uh, at any point in time, it's going to be just a single mathematical value. It's computed in lots of different ways. But, um, so that's a, a fact that we apply to the feedback. And the little circle there is just the basic math. So it's going to take the desired command. So 10 degrees per second is asked for 10 degrees per second. Um, the actual airplane maybe is not moving yet, so it's a zero. So the, where it says roll rate error, that would compute out to 10. Very simple. If he's commanding 10 and the airplane's rolling at 10, then obviously that roll rate error will be zero. So it's, it's really simple math. Um, and then we take through some more games, which we'll get to in a minute. The, uh, at that point where it says roll command, if you can see that, that's kind of a, on a legacy system, that kind of corresponds to a roll, a, an aileron command. I'm going to use aileron because that's what people relate to as, as, as an 
asymmetric wing failure. Um, so that's the, we, that kind of corresponds to like 10 degrees at that point after that game. What we do though is it goes into a mixer, and unfortunately he, he really shouldn't use the C grain because that would be a little more obvious so you have the ailerons on there. What the mixer does is it takes your desired roll command in degrees and it allocates it to the airplane. Uh, for, for an F-35A or an F-16, at low angle attack, it's a very simple calculation. The roll goes to the aileron. Uh, the, the aileron is far and away your best device for generating roll. It generates a lot of roll, not a lot of yaw. Uh, all the other surfaces, uh, not so much. So, so the mixer would have a high gain where that's a K. It would have a high gain going to the, uh, the flaps. Which aileron's for our case. Uh, now part of the mixer is also the ARI. F-16, again, all, all our jets are designed to be feet on the floor. So the coordination is all done automatically, or the best guess at the coordination. <coughs> and I know that is really important. Um, but, and it's not really shown there, but kind of built into that, the rudder command is also automatically computed to coordinate however much aileron, differential aileron is being used. Now, it kind of, in real life, it's kind of a little more complicated than that, but basically that's the function. Okay, how do we get desired dynamics? Well, first of all, I'm going to explain what dynamics are. Basically, dynamics is a, is a way of saying, how does the airplane respond? So, if, he's, if the maximum lower command is, say, 200 degrees per second, the airplane's ability to roll 200 degrees per second is not dynamics, it's performance. Dynamics is really, what does the roll rate look like? What is the shape of the roll rate as it's going from zero to 200? And, and we have a pretty good answer for that. But basically, the dynamics, of course, are a function of the airplane itself. So it depends on how effective are the controls. Uh, it depends on the stability and damping of the airplane, so the aerodynamics. Um, damping is a little bit of a form term, I think, to VA pilots because they don't generate huge roll, uh, roll rates. Basically, that's the aerodynamic resistance to a rolling motion, especially. If you think, uh, like an ice skater spinning, uh, if, if her arms are out and her Sleeves are like really tight and slick. When she's spinning, she has really low roll damping. If she's holding uh, cardboard signs, that's really high roll damping. Okay, the air really wants to keep her, wants to slow her down from spinning. Um, aircraft mass properties, same thing. If she's holding lead weights out in her arms, that's different than if she has them right in here. And all that affects how she responds. Basically, it affects how the airplane responds when you move the control system. The other bullet that's not up there is the, obviously the flight control system, because the flight control system is really responsible for giving you the, air, the dynamics. Okay, so here's the fun chart. Um, and I'll, again, I'll try to get through this quick as I can, but, but it is kind of important. So the way we typically design the gains, and, and you can, the, the gains really set, the structure's kind of set, so those K values, both in the mixer and the, the feedback paths, we call it, those really set the dynamics. In the roll example, this is uh, plotted versus time, and it kind of assumes, I think the example just assumes a 60 degree per second command. This roll shape here, we did not invent. This shape has been basically known and understood since probably the 40s or 50s. In fact, when, when the Wright brothers were doing rolls in their airplanes, they intuitively probably found something very much like that shape. This is the, sh the kind of shape that you will get if you, you know, even in your unaugmented airplane, in your Bonanza, if you put the input in and then start backing it off, what you're doing without realizing it is generating that kind of roll rate response. It's very comfortable, it's not too abrupt, it's not too laggy, it's not uh, PIO prone. So that's kind of the goal, and that's been documented in, in our mill specs and, doc and textbooks forever. So the goal is to get a shape like that. Uh, and you can see it's like one, like the, what we do is kind of measure certain points. Um, and this whole thing scales. So if this is a 60 degree example, if we were commanding 60 degrees, we'd get a lot less thick. If we're commanding 60 degrees, the whole thing would be, you wouldn't just come to six and then flatten out. The whole thing would just shape, would just scale down. Similarly, if it got bigger, if we're commanding 200, the whole thing would just scale up. So this is the, the design goal. So how do we get this airplane to fly like this? Well, it starts in the wind tunnel long before you ever fly the first flight. So they take the, the configuration in the wind tunnel, they do thousands and thousands of hours 
looking at every angle attack, every mod, they have control surfaces, so they test it at every different possible combination of control surfaces, and they come up with a mathematical model that tells us how the airplane flies for a given, you know, where the control surfaces are, size of the angle attack, all that. So we take this huge amount of data, and it is simplified, obviously, somewhat, but that goes into what we call the truth model. So we have an analytical simulation. Uh, it's not necessarily run in real time. Historically, it, it hasn't. Uh, but when we go into design, we have we build a simulation, and it's got that whole mathematical model. It's got a mathematicals for the uh, all the actuators, for all the sensors. So it, as best we can, we model the entire airplane system, beginning to end, in a simulation. And we begin as we as the control loss starts to take shape. Obviously, that's part of it. So we start coding up. Historically, we would code up engineering coding in Fortran back up in F2 days uh, and insert that model in, and that's what we would vary. Um, so then we have tools that have been developed over the years that will go in and, and calculate the best gains to give us the shape. Again, isolated just to the roll axis. So then we, we have, we come up with this the analysis matrix. So it's the entire envelope of the airplane, mock, angle attack, altitude, speed, and different loadings, CG locations, external stores, whatever. So you come up with hundreds and hundreds, depending on how much computing power you have. Uh, F-16 was, you could do about two analysis points an hour. Uh, F-35, we can do like 10,000 in, you know, in a day. So depending on how much time and, and computing power you have to, to analyze a full grid, what these tools will give you is at each, each each point on that analysis matrix, it'll give you the very ideal gains. So it knows this, and it knows how to design to get this, so it, it'll give you a big table of all these gains. And then what you do is you've got all these thousands of data points of ideal gains, and then you've got to figure out how to fit it in the box in the actual control. As I mentioned, F-16, which started out as an analog computer, so capacitors, resistors, relays, uh, subsonically, that number is constant, 0.12. So basically, everywhere you fly subsonic, 0.12 is what you get, because that's what the capability that we have. So if you happen to be right at the point where that was your ideal gain, the airplane flies as it should. If you're flying somewhere else where the gain should maybe be 0.16, you've still got 0.12, so the airplane is not flying its optimal gains. Obviously, you just deal with that because that's what you have. Uh, F-22, we have uh, exponentially more computing power, more memory for our control op. Uh, so we end up with fairly complex tables. I uh, think the low angle attack, I think it's mock and QR, or mock and altitude, basically. Uh, at high alpha, I use mock and alpha. So again, the tables weren't huge, uh, and just no surprise, F22, F35, both. We absolutely used every bit of throughput and every bit of memory that we had. Right? We expand the system to the capability of the processor that's going to be on board. So it's a it's an arduous process. You take, for instance, in F-35, you take all these game datas, and, or F-22, and say, okay, this is the box that I can fit this in, and you do a lot of staring at the data, coming, coming up with correlations, trying to minimize the areas where it's different. So you say, hey, that looks good, versus angle of attack and mock, so I'll use that, you know. Um, so you really, it's a struggle. It takes a, a lot of manual work to get the best possible game schedule. So basically, Again, not F-16, but F-22, F-35, these are tables, function of mock and alpha, that get looked up every single frame. The control laws F-35 run at 80 hertz. So this, the entire system is getting evaluated and updated 80 times a second. So we're sending out a new command to all the actuators uh, 80 times a second. The other two airplanes are similar. That was fast. Okay. Uh, so now that was just one axis. So now we also have other axes. We have pitch. We have yaw, and they all have their own individual requirements. So we have roll mode, which is what we call that picture in the, in the roll axis. Uh, pitch is actually more confusing, because um, there's certain G, that G responses you get when you pull. There's um, several more criteria that go into that equation. But it's basically the same thing. You find your ideal gains, the, the thousand data points, and then you winnow it down so it'll fit in the control law. Um, the mixer. I can spend a quite a while talking about the mixer. Basically what the mixer does is it's responsible for uh, taking all these individual commands 
and turning them into individual service commands. Um, again, as I mentioned, a low angle attack, a roll command is going to go to the halons. Now, like for the C model, you have halons and flacons. So the mixer is going to decide whether to send both, send an equal command to both surfaces, or if it might make sense to use more asymmetric fralian flap and less aileron, uh, or might maybe other conditions that makes more sense to use more aileron. So it's it's kind of optimize the control surface usage. Again, in a legacy system, that's all it comes down to the engineer, the, to the designer. He has to pre-program those relationships. Uh, the other thing that the mixer does is um, we use, especially as we go toward higher higher angle attack, we start to lose water effectiveness. The next best device for yaw is asymmetric horizontal tails. Unfortunately, we're still using the horizontal tails for pitch control. So the mixer says, okay, the, the pitch axis wants 10 degrees of symmetric, the, the roll axis, roll yaw axis wants 10 degrees asymmetric. So what it would do is it would put, it would command one surface to 20, the other one to zero. So the average is still 10, and you still have your asymmetric command. That, that all falls into the mixer. The problem is, if you start moving and one of them hits a stop, so physically they can only move so far. So you hit a stop, now the mixer has to make a choice. Do I continue to hold the asymmetric command? And, and maybe now, the, maybe, maybe the pitch is saying, I want nose down, I want surfaces completely trailing edge down to get the nose down. And the roll is also saying, hey, I want 20 degrees asymmetric. So the mixer has to make the decision, do I give the pitch all it wants and not give the, the roll all what it wants, or do I do it the other way around? Uh, in general, the pitch always wins, because we always want to maintain control angle attack. So what happens is you would sacrifice, in a good system, you would sacrifice roll capability that would translate through. But again, the mixer has to make the, those choices. And in a legacy system, again, the engineer has to design all those paths. He has to hard code all those paths into the mixer. Is that all the appropriate games? And then it gets complicated, because now we have a surface failure, right? So now, all of a sudden, the left aileron is not working. It's a hydraulic system. It's it's very reliable. They're all very reliable, but they can't fail. So now the mixer says, oh crap, I can't use the left aileron. What am I supposed to do? There's nothing automatic about the system to tell it to what to do. So the engineer, the designer, again, has to come in and say, OK, I'm going to add a switch. If we get an indication that the left aileron's failed, here's how we're going to reallocate. Here's how we're going to we're gonna handle that. Um, and similarly, if, if a sur any surface is, is limited, but especially failures, and hopefully we know that the failure happens. If the failure doesn't happen, I mean, if, if it happens and we don't know about it, that's, that's a little more uh, scary sometimes. And we don't always know where it's at. That's the other thing. F-22, I think we normally would know where the surface was when it was failed, which is information that we can feed into the mixer so we can account, at least we know where it's at. Uh, sometimes we don't know, we just kind of assume that it's going in a certain position. Okay, I got five minutes left to finish this one. Okay, again, the failures. Okay, so interdynamic modeling and interdynamic conversion. Um, so this is not a new concept. Lockheed did not invent this. It's been around, I think, since the 80s. Primarily in um, kind of academia research. Um, but it was chosen for this airplane with a bit of risk. Um, so, and again, I'm going to speed it up here. Um, so, so the function now is, uh, the commands are basically the same. So the pilot has an input to the commands block, it's got a gradient. Uh, so the regulator takes over a lot of the function that the legacy design had before. And then stuff happens there. So um, the, the green line, and I don't want to get into the, to the weeds yet. So basically on the left hand side, so left of the green line, that's yeah, we'll come back to this, because I want to get this other picture on there. OK, so if you remember where the green line was, it's right where that was. So the regulator is basically in charge of the <coughs> dynamics. So it has the feedback, and you show that it's got the roll rate feedback coming in. Probably should actually just go into the regular blocks. Um, but at any point in time, it knows um, how it wants the airplane to fly. So for instance, if we are out here, say time two seconds, uh, the regular knows that he was asking for 60 on Vermont OEM. That's what it does. 
Um, so it really spits out, the onward moment really spits out two, two key pieces of information. It spits out what it thinks, based on its information, what the current acceleration is in each axis, so roll rate, yaw rate, pitch rate, whatever. Um, and it does that based on, I think it'll show up here. Um, right, so it has an error index. So basically, I talked to you earlier about the truth model. So that we use in our simulation, so it's got thousands and thousands of data points uh, to model the aerodynamics. So what we do is we take that and we winnow it down. It's still huge, but we cut it down in size, simplify it as best we can, and we put it into the airplane. So we put it into the control log. So that aircraft model actually includes a, a simplified version of our full, full up blown simulation aerodynamic model. Um, it also includes the engine model, because we have to know, especially in stolen mode, we have to know what the thrust is, or that the engine out of the fan. It also has to know the mass properties, so if we, sell, we send it uh, the fuel state for every tank, and it figures out where the CG is, it figures out all the inertias, and it uses all that information along with um, all that other stuff. Obviously, each bearing has its own model, their ones are aerodynamically different. Um, it also has to know where the control sources all are. So that comes in there. Of course, angle attack, beta, altitude bonds, all that comes in there for the pet tables, as I mentioned, all the mass properties. So the aircraft model spits out what it thinks based on its version of the data, what the current acceleration is, and that's the reference that we're closing the loop on. Uh, the effective blend we're going to go through this is this is basically just math. And nobody cares about math. Basically, what it's doing was is it uses the information that has been given from the onboard model. Um, let me back up, I did skip something. Sorry. So the other line. Okay, so the, so that, so I just described the red arrow coming left. The control effective estimates, that's the other key part that has to come out of this. So what the aircraft model does, again, it does this every single frame, is it can, makes its initial calculations as to what the aircraft accelerations are. Then it goes through a whole sequence of perturbing things, moving things. So for instance, Again, this is all in simulation, the actual airplane's not doing this. Um, it'll move the aileron like 10 degrees. And then it'll go through all its calculations and it'll see what the accelerations are. Then it'll move the aileron 10 degrees the other way. And it'll do all its calculations. And then it'll say, okay, how much did the acceleration change? Divide that by 20, that's my slope. So that tells me how effective that aileron is in roll. And it also does it in yaw and pitch, and so basically every turn. And then it goes through all the control surfaces on the airplane. So then it does the right flap, and it does the rudder, and it does the other rudder, and it does the tail. So it, it builds this huge matrix of control effectiveness. It's basically going to tell the effective blender what's going to happen, what we think is going to happen, when it moves a control surface. Now, if that sounds like a game, that's exactly a game. And this is the first place where we really see the benefit of MDI. All that little game design stuff that the designer have, used to have to do on his own, through other tools, that's actually happening in real time, every single frame. So the designer doesn't care about the control surface of that fact, the EV's got it. So all we really have to, to worry about is making sure that the regulator is spitting out the right commands. So again, the effective blender is just some math that did this. Um, what it's trying to do is it's find, trying to find the best solution given its understanding of the airplane. And you see that what it does, and those, those values that are coming out those are actually changes to control surfaces. It's not, they're not absolute control surfaces. Basically it says, I have, I have this much error in roll acceleration and acceleration. I want to move the surfaces from wherever they're at in a certain direction, a certain amount. Um, and of course, it gets more complicated than that. Um, the, in, in the perfect situation, then those just go through to the airplane. Uh, but obviously we have situations with position rate limits. So if a, surf, a surface is on, on its position limit, it can't go any further. So if, like if the rudder's at 30, and the, the first pass through the vector blender says, oh, the rudder 40, then obviously that doesn't work. Uh, similarly on rate limits. Uh, if the, the command from one frame to the next is faster than the, the actuator can move, then the, um, the, the vector blender figures that out. So basically, this kind of iterates. So we come to one first pass, and if everything's satisfied and there's no limits, then it just goes on through. If it finds limits, uh, from either rate or position, then it locks that position in place. It's okay, I'm going to move as far as I can, and then I'm going to go recalculate and see where to pick up the, the rest of the air. So this, this thing can actually move through a few times, 
E-frame. And again, it spits out the control surfaces, uh, and it's all mathematized to uh, give you the best, best possible solution. So that's kind of the, basically the mixer. So you notice there's no mixer in the effective blender or in, in, in the eye. It's all inherently handled by all that stuff. And we still have to tell it um, priorities. For instance, pitch versus roll yaw, the case I mentioned, or uh, especially high angle tech, when surfaces start saturating, you can't necessarily get both the roll and the yaw command. So you have to pick which the prior effects you all would roll, prior for its job, is what I can control the size of. Um, so again, there's no gain scheduling, and there is a little bit, because again, the regulator, you wind up, um, in the real world, you, there's a lot of other things other than just the roll mode that go into what's coming out of the regulator, and you wind up scheduling a lot of stuff there. Um, it says done, that's sarcastic. Uh, so here's a, here's a review. A review. I'm over the top of these charts, so I'm going to go real quick. So again, basically the regulator spits out how the airplane wants to fly, the effective blender and the onboard models say, here's what you got to do to do that. Benefits, normal gain scheduling. You can do multiple designs very quickly. The regulator is pretty much the same for all three variants. Um, same stuff I kind of already covered. The, the problem is it takes a lot of throughput, which is one of the reasons that we, could not, we couldn't even begin to approach this with that 22 technology, which is basically you know, 1980s process for people. Uh, and also it takes a lot of memory. Uh, the onboard model needs to be pretty accurate. I'll go to that second. And then you have to also include the propulsion model, mass properties, so you have to have a lot of information coming in. Um, this kind of leads into the high angle attack. I'm not going to show this video here. Um, but basically what we did, we'll talk about departures more in the next charts. Um, yeah, high angle attack, we'll talk about that. But part of the problem with high angle attack is you really start to lose control power, so the rudder starts to really get weak. Um, and the big issue with, with NDI is that it gets, things get nonlinear. So the rudder is, has one effectiveness, typically from like 0 to 10, and then as you deflect it further from 20 to 30 degrees, it gets less and less effective. So now we have the problem of what number does the OBM pick? When it's doing its control surface, the, the effectiveness, does it pick the number from 0 to 10? Or does it pick the slope from 0 to 30, which can be a lot less? And that really winds up making a lot of, of, of impact on what the decisions that the effective blender makes. You can also have cases, um, and here's my little, this was supposed to be bigger when I ordered it, um, but I wanted to kind of show, so the, the, the stick here is the velocity vector. So if you're flying at 45 angle of attack, say roughly like that, um, the wind surfaces, as you deflect them trailing edge down, you're really increasing the local angle attack. So you're, you're kind of post stall so you're not really generating more lift. Um, what happens is, is if you deflect these further down, you can actually get, you're wanting to lift this way, it can actually destroy lift. So by increasing what you think you're increasing lift on this side, you can actually destroy lift. So it actually goes the wrong way. Uh, the effector blender really hates that when you do that. When you change the slope from going one way to the other way, Mathematically, it does not like that. It's a discontinuity, and it really does not like that. Um, so that kind of falls to the designer to just to internally limit those commands so that it just doesn't go there. So that's uh, kind of a hands-on part. It really was a big, big issue at Angle Attack. Um, and we're going to see this chart. Recovery mode, so if we, whether it's a spin or some other out-of-control mode, um, you know, the design for our system has to be pretty mature before we even go to first flight. So there was a lot of uh, hand wringing early on about will this even work? You know, the potential was you get on very first flight and have a departure go into a spin. And the last thing you wanted to do was to activate another mode within the NDI that was uncertain to begin with to try to recover. So, uh, you know, Lockheed, we have a lot of experience with F-16, F-22, um, as far as recovery modes, getting out of spins. So what we do in this airplane is we kind of NDI is still running, but we kind of hack into it, we kind of trick it, so that it really gives us fixed relationships, so we know exactly what it's going to do given an angle tag in the RA. Uh, it was really risk, risk reduction. Um, all right, so let me go through a couple of these, and these we'll cover in the next chart that I want to get to. So in theory, that's reality. Now, if you haven't noticed, the, uh, that acceleration error that we're really closing the loop on 
that's virtual. That's really not connected to the real airplane. So the, the issues that we ran into was when the onboard model and the actual airplane don't match, which typically means the, uh, the actual airplane you're flying in is different than your wind tunnel model, it's different than your simulation model. So that was, uh, again, it's, a, it's an approximation in the first place. Um, and it's, there's still a lot of interpretation to go involved. Um, so we have handling coordinates issues. So in other words, the airplane's not flying like you expected, even if it's not a departure. Um, you basically, you look at the flight data and you tune your truth model first, and then you see if you can make the appropriate changes in the onboard model as well. The nice thing about that is, if it's fairly reasonable changes, you're done. You don't have to go reschedule the regulator. It's just now the, the onboard model and the effective blender will work a whole lot better than it did before. Uh, if it's huge changes, then it does require more work. Um, so the, the next step, if that doesn't work, is further augmentation. Um, and so what that's really doing is that's, and that's where I spent a lot of time in the high alpha envelope, is the onboard model was either not good or, well, let me rephrase that. The aerodynamics were so messed up that there was no way the onboard model could, could model it. We had things like hysteresis effects. So if the, you say, if the aileron, you like to say if the aileron's at 10 degrees, what's the rolling moment? Well, guess what, it depends. If, it, if the aileron was coming from this direction and stopped at 10, it could be one thing. If it was past 10 and came back to 10, it could be a different thing. Again, the onboard model was not equipped to handle that. So what we did was we had some augmentations that actually used feedbacks from the actual airplane that's kind of a sanity check, kind of a correction factor on what was coming out of the onboard model. Now that only affected the total acceleration error. It's still, we, there was really no way, real time, to, to affect those control factors in the uh, Avoid some issues, buff it, whatever, you just, there's nothing you can do, you just got to limit it. Um, so here's an example, we, I'm gonna skip this. We went out and flew, we got a lot more sites left, our wings all the sites at the line attack. Uh, we updated the, they updated the onboard model and went from a little bit of an undershoot, went from an overshoot to a little bit of an undershoot. With the further augmentation, you see it initially undershoots, and then the, the secondary augmentation we added in kind of closes that loop tighter and actually gets us back to the command. Um, so here's a case. So this is actual, real, it's, a, it's an animation, but it's actual flight test data. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later, hopefully, about what a departure is. It's kind of subjective. Um, this is a departure. So what, what it's going to do is it's going to, it's a low angle tech is going to pull, and it's going to roll to the left. If I can get to go. Um, go, stop. Years. 
uh, seven different claw adjustments over five years, uh, but then they finally did get it uh, to work out. So basically, NDI works, uh, not out of the box, but pretty close. And I'm already late. So let me get to the other charts. All right, so there's my name finally. Um, so the high angle attacks, and this covers both the control and development and the flight test. Um, so why high angle attack for a fifth generation fighter? That's a discussion for someone above my pay grade. Uh, as you probably know, the, the, the role of the F-35 is to be a stealth fighter. It's got great, amazing avionics, radars. It's supposed to just sit off in the distance and shoot missiles at you. Uh, if you ever get in close to a dogfight, Something's probably gone wrong, <coughs> but that was our requirement. Uh, so our requirements: perform air to air tracking up to stall. Uh, for some reason, I'm not allowed to say what the stall angle attack is. It, it depends on the variant. It's uh, I can tell you, I'll say it's somewhere between 25 and 40, depending on the variant. Um, so based, and again, perform air to air tracking is a little subjective. But it basically means if you've got a target in front of you, you should be able to control the airplane well enough to kind of keep the pepper on. Um, above stall, up until we are 50 off the airplane, I can say that. Uh, between the stall and we'll attack at 50, we have to be controllable, positive, predictable, which means when the pilot moves the stick, when it already does, the airplane's going to follow this command. Uh, departure resistant, again, the phrase departure is a little subjective. A spin is clearly a departure. The thing I showed you earlier is clearly a departure. Uh, if he's Turn up in a bank and you put the roll stick in and it's a two second, three second delay before the airplane moves. Is that a departure? Well, again, that's where it gets kind of great. Um, but it's only resistance, so it's not, you know, previous airplane had a departure proof requirement, which meant no matter what you did, you couldn't depart. We have a little bit laxer uh, requirement. The other one that I'll talk about is out of control mode. So if we are to get into something that looks like a spin or a deep stall, um, we have to be able to get out of that with basically the pilot not doing anything. Um, and the challenge is the airplane was really not designed for high alpha. When they were going through configuration, they were looking at stealth, weight, range, all that stuff. And so high alpha was really not on their plate of considerations. Uh, so it's kind of aerodynamic, it's definitely what we call fallout capability. Uh, again, here's the models. The one thing I was going to point out here, uh, a couple things. If you look at the empty weights along the bottom, the C is our heaviest at 34.8. It's going know what an empty B-17 weighs. It's about 35,000 pounds. So our empty weight is pretty close to where an empty B-17 weighs. Um, the one thing I was going to point out here, talking about the model, if, if you see an F-22 out, I think they're going to be here later maybe this week, look at the uh, vertical tail configuration. Uh, I can get the point, I can get the point up there. Um, you'll notice our rudder is pretty conventional. It's kind of uh, parallelogram. If you notice the F-22 rudder, it's more of a trapezoid. So the, the, the leading edge of the rudder part that moves is actually angled the other way. Uh, and that's something that really improves the, the rudder performance. Not at 50 alpha, at 50 alpha it's all washed out. Um, but in that kind of intermediate 20 to 35 in that range, uh, this was a case where the F-22 said, yeah, we need a high for a plane. F-35 said, no, oh, whatever. We have other considerations. Um, the, uh, the one, and I wish it was bigger, uh, but I want to talk real quick. The upper right chart. So what that is is that's pitching moment uh, on the vertical axis versus angle attack on the uh, on the horizontal. And the slope of those, so each line is a constant horizontal tail. So if the tails were the bottom line is um, both tails full trailing the edge down, just stuck there. The middle chart would be both tails streamlined. Um, and uh, the fact that that's the slope is positive, that's our indication that we have an unstable airplane. So if you're on the black line and the horizontal, uh, the, the axis across the middle, in order to be trimmed, flying on straight level, you have to stay on that line. So what happens is, if you say if you're at zero, so you're at zero tail, if you fly along and you get a little disturbance, it's going to push you uh, up. So you're going to get more positive uh, total pitching moment of the airplane, and that's going to push you to the right. Well, guess what? That means you get even more positive pitching moment which is going to push you further to the right. So that slope, is, is if, if, the, if the horizontal tails don't respond, once you leave that tail, you're basically gone until you get way out there. 
which if you're going slow, that's annoying. If you're two angle attack and all of a sudden you're at 40, that's annoying. If you're at 400 knots on the deck and you're at 1G and that happens, then within a second or so, you're at 20, 30 Gs, your wings have ripped off and bad things happen, which is why we have uh, this flight pool system operating in 80 hertz a second, because it's constantly moving the tails to keep you stable. The other point I want to point out is um, the actual deep stall. So we have, enough, we have a deep stall for some, for most configurations, depending on the CG. Uh, S16 is kind of famous for that. Uh, so what, basically what happens is we, we reach a certain angle of attack, let's call it 50, 60, actually it's probably 67, I'm not sure why, where instead of being unstable, as you see, we get very, very stable. So what happens is if you wind, if you find yourself out there, uh, if you look at the bottom chart where the red circle is, so the horizontal tails are full nose down, trying to get down, trying to keep your nose down, um, but there's no nose down moment. So basically what could happen is if you get out to say 70 angle attack, you're just gonna sit there and you, the pilot can push all day, it doesn't matter if the surface is given all it's can, so you're just stuck there. They had this on S16 that came up with something you probably heard called uh, pitch rocking, which they enabled through the, the called MPO, manual pitch override. So what that does is the guy can hit a switch in the cockpit, and if, if other criteria met as far as speed, etc., cetera, uh, basically it, it kind of bypasses most of the flight control law, and it puts him in direct connection with the horizontal tails. So then what he can do is, he's on this red dot, full frame inch down. So then instead of pushing, he pulls. So that shoots him up to this line, which gives him a whole bunch of nose up pitching mode, and it shoots him out here. So then he's, he, he's increasing the attack, and then he, when, it, when that starts to die off and it starts to level out, then he pushes. So then he comes through this spot, and now he has some momentum. And sometimes it takes a couple of cycles, but basically it, the more he does this, it ramps up until eventually he has enough momentum to carry him back through this point. Um, again, F-16, that was, was totally manual, so he had to hit switch, he had to, he had to basically do it on his own. F-35 is completely, has a completely automated system. So it recognizes when you're out here, and it waits a couple of seconds to make sure you're stuck, uh, and then it goes through that process completely automatically. It disconnects the pilot uh, from the system, and it does the pitch rocking. And there's a couple of sub-modes. It, it can be fully automatic, or the pilot can request it. If the pilot thinks, hey, I think I'm stuck, rather than wait the two seconds, he can hit a, a switch in the cockpit, and if the other criteria are met, then the, the airplane will automatically go into a fully automatic pitch rocking mode. We also have a manual pitch rocking mode, which is different combination of, of buttons. And that will actually, as long as he's fairly close to this area, it will actually do what an MPO does on F-16. So it will actually give him direct control back through the surfaces. Uh, with the current design, there's really no reason, especially with all the information we have, this is an area where the NDI really helps, because we have a lot more information than we used to. We can use all that for these recovery modes. We know where the CG is, we know where the external stores are, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we really can do a pretty good job with the fully automated system. Uh, but we wound up using the MPR for a lot of the flight tests, kind of as a tool to explore the environment in flight tests. Uh, so a lot of extra stuff I'll skip. Basically this lower chart just says, as you go, as you increase the angle attack, the rudder really turns away. This is, uh, normally this is kind of how much rudder or differential tail you need to coordinate like a 10 degree aileron deflection. And so the low angle attack, the red line is below the green, which means it's your best device. Uh, but you just reach a certain angle attack where the rudder is just not effective. So you have to use uh, asymmetric horizontal tail for your control. We've already seen this. Uh, we found out how, how dependent uh, actual modeling actually is in the model, especially the angle attack. So here's our, I'm going to kind of use this to talk through a little bit of design. This is actually our flight test program. It says it was highly efficient, I guess that's true. Well, those, I remember I said I came on the program in 05. The first flight for AF was 2012. Um, so I had, and I didn't get an eye off right away, but there were, I had roughly three or four years solid of design before we ever got in flight test. And I had about a year, you can see here, a little more, where AF was the only one flying, and my life was reasonably comfortable. And then this crap all happened. We had three variants all finding their own issues very quickly, very little time for it to turn around OFG, so a lot of data flooding, flooding us. 
Um, so, the, so the green lines here, uh, that's just our basic expansion. So this would be very more or less docile maneuvers. You just collect it to 50 alpha new cushions, do a roll double it, you know, single axis so you're not coordinating, you're not doing multiple inputs. Uh, just kind of verify our aerodynamic, verify the things that just didn't fall apart. The departure recovery, and I've got a couple videos on this. Um, this is where we went out and intentionally departed the airplane. Now, as I mentioned, the system has to be pretty robust on day one. So there's really no good way at high speed to, in, to actually depart the airplane. So that's why they use the NPR. And they also use a lot of tail slides. Now, I'm going to use my monitor real quick. Um, tail slides are, are particularly um, crafty ways to get around the angle attack under. One thing I should have mentioned back on the CM chart was, um, I guess I can do it quick. Sorry, I'm trying to hurry up. This is good stuff. So, right, so if you go back to the upper chart, the shape of those curves is highly dependent on the center of gravity. So at a Ford CG, you may not really, you may never get to the case where you can get into each doll because you have, you have nose down vision moment everywhere. At CGs, it, may, it actually gets worse. So where you see that bottom line, the, the lower line is just full nose down, where that crosses that axis, that's the no-go to place. If you go to that place, you can stabilize theoretically, but angle of disturbance will send you instantly out into no man's land. And again, the surfaces are all the way down. So we have we do have an alpha limiter in this airplane, and, and what they do is they kind of they come up with a schedule based on this, this data, they kind of backs you off to the left of where that lower the uh, green line crosses the zero axis. So you have a little margin between the angle of limiter, the uh, angle of tech limiter, where you're really losing. Well, that is highly scheduled with CG. Um, and you also see the little dash line, if you open the web main doors, that tends to deteriorate things. So we have lower angle attack with the doors open. Um, so depth, taxes, and pilot tape limiters. Uh, that's the three thing you count on. And uh, Doc Nelson is here, he's one of our test pilots. Uh, he'll tell you that for sure because they, they always think that we're limiting too much. Uh, one thing I can tell you with, with this airplane, with all the information we have, uh, with all the throughput we had compared to previous airplanes, it is really, really close. We really optimized the heck out of this. So they still don't like the limits, uh, but there's, we went a long way to minimize the areas where we had to limit the airplane. Um, so, but the, but the, so the one sure way to defeat the off limiter is to do a tail slide. Now you see, you'll see tail slides out here during the air show. Um, but the reason they're so sneaky, again, here's my little velocity back there, and I, I realize it should be through the middle of the airplane. So basically what happened on the tail slide, you're basically at zero angle attack. You're, you're pointing straight up, you're flying straight up. As you bleed off airspeed, as you bleed off airspeed, you're still at low angle attack. So you can literally be, and this thing, imagine this run, you can be at two knots, one knot, Still pointed up, still being at zero angle attack. Well, the flight control system doesn't care if you're zero angle attack. The problem is when you go to zero, now you've got your angle attack is now not, it's not zero, it's undefined because you're dividing by zero. So you go to that point when you're actually stuck in the air, there's no angle attack. Now you start moving backwards, two knots backwards, now you're not, now you've gone from zero to 180 degrees angle attack in a very short period of time with a very slow airspeed. And the, so you, now you've completely defeated the angle attack limit because you went way past 50. Uh, and it wouldn't matter anyway because no matter what the control system does, it's not having an effect. We don't have to respect the F-22 has big respiratory nozzles, so you get some level of control even at zero speed. Uh, if you had this big prop in front of you, blowing air over the wings, you could at least get something out of it. But we basically have no control at all. So what happens is, you're, now you're kind of like dropping a dart backwards. You really have no control over what happens next. Um, you may fall, as you begin to pick up airspeed, again, it's really stable, um, you may fall on your tummy, so you may go like from negative 180 to 90 angle attack, and then theoretically hit the hit our deep stall point at, at 70. You can also fall, if you fall a little bit backwards, you can wind up in the air with the stick, the thing will go that way. So you can, now you can fall this way, so now you're at negative 90, uh, basically invert, which is also, we don't actually have, I don't want to try, we actually don't have an inverted deep stall point. So that will pretty much self recover. The really bad ones are if you're a little bit offset, departures is inertial coupling. So basically, your basic physics, we have a pitch rate, roll rate, yaw rate, 
any two of those together, so if you have pitch rate and roll rate at the same time, that couples into a yawing moment. So it couples into the third axis and it works in every combination. So one of the most challenging, and this is kind of a sample test card, one of the most challenging maneuvers, and it starts out low angle attack, winds up high angle attack, there's two on long at 200 knots, 300 knots of long angle attack, but in full roll stick, get maximum rate, 100 degrees, whatever, maximum roll rate, and then pull. So you've got your roll rate established, and then you put in the pitch rate on top of it. And that couples into a lot of yaw rate, which can generate a lot of side slip. And you generate side slip as you pull into high angle attack. So that's kind of a typical worst case maneuver. Um, and if you run out of rudder, and you don't compensate, then that can lead to a lot of issues. So they did, as you can see, they did a lot of departures and success. Uh, the, final, the final block there was operational assessment. So this is actually um, where you actually just kind of let the pilots go out and fly it. It was still somewhat scripted a lot of times, but as you can see, that was not really the priority for the, uh, for, for the development program. So that's kind of going on now. Uh, most of the groups are really great. This would be a push. Uh, again, they may take off the labels, but you can assume that's kind of max angle attack. So this would be in the early stages. You just trim up max angle attack, push on the stick, and see what happens. Uh, the, the red line would be our simulation. The blue line would be what actually happened in flight test. So we matched it pretty well. Um, so this is an APR recovery. So uh, you'll see a pitch rock here. I think this is a single rock. This is a case where you use MPR to, to defeat the alpha limiter and kind of stabilize the high angle attack. And then you kind of the, the logic in, this, in the airplane to turn off MPR so then the normal system took over, so then the automatic system kicked off. Um, Still got the NPR active here. So there's a the pitch up. It's kind of hard to see. And then the airplane, the nose just falls down. Oh, wait, there's the pitch up right there, sorry. And then it just goes right down. So a single rock recovery. I see. Uh, and I'm not going to show this video. Negative recurve, there's really nothing there. We did the same thing. We used MPR to get us to a large negative impact and, and let the system come on. Uh, tail slides were mostly on events. Um, again, this is actual light. And this one, he's actually rolling as he has a little airspeed left right before he runs out of airspeed to challenge the system. So he's hanging there. You can't hear that out there, but the, you can hear the system saying auto recover, which basically is telling the pilot, I've got to control of the airplane, don't bother, and that's what I did. Um, but, so this is our, actually, this is uh, part of the uh, departure uh, recovery mode. What they, what they had us do, and Air Force had never done this before, the Navy, this was big on there. So what we did was we kind of added special logic only for flight tests into the flight control system, which basically turn off all our recovery logic. So all our spin logic, all the things that would turn on those modes, we disable them. And then we, we basically hook directly from the pedals to the tails, the asymmetric tails, um, so that the pilot could, could do, and again, we still use MPR to get to 60 or 70 angle attack, and then use the pedals to wrap up the airplane in, in yard. And so then what happened, and this one I think is a 60 degree per second, so it gets up to roughly 60 degrees per second of yard rate. And then he hits a switch, and it's kind of like if you have a sprinkler system in your building and you've turned it off and then you set the fire and you let the fire get going nice and strong and then you flip the, the sprinkler system on and you sit back and see what it can do. Uh, it's very similar here. We put the system to sleep. We've made things really bad and then we, with a flip over switch we turn it on so it wakes up kind of in the middle of this mess. Um, and So, so it's the same for this, the computer, computer animation on the left. So if you, if you watch the yellow and the blue, that means he's still in a special flight test mode. So he's wrapped it up to a good spin. And right there, 
where the red light comes on, that's when the system woke up. So you can see it used about a quarter of a turn. So it's wrapped up really high yaw rate. When you turn on the system, I can, I can show that again if you want. Um, so it, again, it wraps up. And from the time that, if you look at the little displays in the lower right hand corner, when that, when that goes red, that means the system is being woken up. It's on like the next turn. And then it's right there, so it's less than a quarter of a turn to get out of that spin. And then it just knows it's on down. Uh, the system is very robust. Uh, we, we had to design it with uh, max asymmetry, so a bunch of stuff on the wing, and then the weapon base completely loaded on one side, not the other side, so the symmetry is way off to the side. Uh, had to work for that. Um, we did find some surprises. Um, this was kind of a fair enough test that it all matter. We had, a, we had some pitch rocking uh, early on, so the, the upper right is angled attack. So the, where the dash line is, he, he used again, he used MPR to get us, or no, this is actually a tail slide. You can see how this the third chart is really slow speed. So we had some logic issues with the APR. Um, it came on a little too soon. It was, uh, and it wasn't optimized. So we had like a three cycle. So that's, I guess, four <coughs> cycle, maybe three or four cycle uh, APR recovery. Um, so we used that to fix a lot of the logic and kind of to modify the games. So that won't happen again. Really pretty much everything we have will come out in one of the two cycles. Or even failure cases from the CG way out the doors open. Um, so if this is a tail slide. This one did not go well. This was pretty early on the program. I had to say it we really got. Um, but this was a tail slide that it falls on its back, so it goes to negative angle attack. Loops first. If you can kind of follow the red line, that's the velocity vector. So if he's falling, he's still kind of climbing. So now he's falling, so now he's falling on his back. And he whips around, so now he's got a lot of side slip. He's a lot of a lot of side slip. And he falls back on his back. And he finally winds up in a positive angle attack. And you're going to see a pitch. So finally it settles down. And now you're going to see that moves on. So there's the pitch drop cycle. Pitches the nose way up. And then it came down. In this case, I'm not sure where the CG was, but the doors were definitely open. Um, so, and this actually turned into not so much an aerodynamic issue. There was some air data system. Obviously, the, the, the effectiveness of the flight control system depends on how effective, how accurate the, the data that's getting as far as angle attack and size them. And what happened was there was a little bit of logic uh, in the inverted. So if you had a very large negative angle attack, um, and so your pneumatic probes that are all that are on their plane, they're really not reliable, so there's some switching and stuff within that inertia system. So anyway, we had a, we wound up lying to the system. So in the middle of that, it told the flight controls, hey, I'm in 15 alpha or whatever, but it was in the normal operating mode. So the basically the control I said, oh, everything's fine. And went back to normal operation, and things really weren't fine. Um, that was the air data system that did that, that, that totally get resolved so that so we reflew stuff like that, um, and nothing, you know, it was completely fixed somehow. Right now there's really no issues that we have as far as departures or uh, other than if you go out and run out airspeed, which anything will happen. So that is actually all my charts, and I'm sorry I ran long, so are there any questions that I can grab? Yes? How is it possible for an airfoil not to stall until it's 25 or 30 or 40 degrees? Um, it's, it's the design of the airfoil. It's, and again, it's not, um, Ron Bloom made a great talk, if you ever get to hear him talk about uh, stall, the angle attack and stall. Uh, the entire airplane doesn't stall. So when we say it's stall, that really means that the, the wing is just stopped generating more lift. It doesn't necessarily fall all the way off. Um, Stuart Johnson's here, who's a former co-worker of mine, who's the SNC expert, so he can answer that question. Um, but basically, and, and the other thing that I'll point out, I don't want to take too long, I meant to do this, was, um, at 45, so, so I can just tell you 45 is post stall. Um, so that's roughly 45. So one thing to notice is, so this is your velocity vector. So if you want, if you want to fly straight and level, if you have a 40,000 pound airplane, gravity is always in the same direction. So you need 40,000 pounds of lift, lifting this way. Well, your wing, may, your wing may have stopped generating lift at 35. So it's still generating lift, but just not a lot. Well, look where your thrust is. Right, the thrust is pointing this way. So 
So roughly sine of 45 on your thrust is in this direction. So actually it's somewhat, even though the wing is post stall the thrust is now filling in that gap. So, and that's exactly why we can fly around a 50 angle attack without that much lift. Now, the other problem of that is we want to go this way, which means we need thrust going this way. This is very, so this is creating a ton of drag and we're losing thrust. If you think about going to 90 angle attack, now we have nothing pushing us this way, which is why you always wind up falling if you go post stall. So if you're in a deep stall or whatever, you by definition wind up falling because you have nothing that can propel you this way. Any, yes? How unstable is the F-35 in which in terms of time to double up? Um, actually, I don't know that. I, and that was one of the things I was going to research before I came. Uh, it really depends on the, the where the CG is again, for the very far out CGs, I think it's pretty quick. Um, again, I can't quote you that number. Um, unfortunately, that's kind of a low angle attack thing that I never really got involved in uh, as far as the basic game design and the low angle attack. So, but it, it's pretty quick. Um, and supersonically, the aerodynamic center moves aft, so that the curve that I showed with the CM plot actually kind of flattens out and actually goes stable. So, supersonic, most jets are stable to some degree, it's really subsonic where you have the ACG, so we have that unstable airframe. Yes? How do you handle uh, store separation? The what? Uh, store separation. Um, store separations, we, um, I don't know, in the onboard model, I think there's a kind of, I think it's basically just time, time. I don't think we actually try to model, you know, it's five feet away, it's 10 feet away, or whatever. I think we kind of assume, you know, we have the aerodynamic model with the store without it. And then, and we know when the source been separated, and I think it kind of maybe two seconds or something kind of blends from one from one uh, data set to the next to the other. Uh, yeah. Uh, of course, mass properties wise, you know, because that can move the CG as well. So it's not just aerodynamics; it's also CG, uh, and I, that may be blended over time. But that may be quicker. I think we may respond to that. To the fact, you know, if, if it's a full tank, especially that would drop, the CG is going to move very quickly. And I think we probably. Factor that that effect in pretty quickly without time delay. Yes. Are there any limits in the model which is the actual pilot to a high G situation of the pilot? We do have G limiters. So um, is, is that your question? The question about if there's limits to protect the pilot. Uh, the, I, I'm pretty sure this is out there. The the A variant is a 9G airplane, just like F-16. Um, the B and C models are a little bit reduced. This, in fact, all Navy airplanes are really like seven and a half Gs, roughly. Uh, we're similar to that. It's those airplanes that are heavier because of the the beefed up landing gear and the structure. So the heavier it is, the stronger the wings have to be to go to the higher Gs. So they actually just accept the lower Gs. Uh, the B has to, to protect the, those lift fan and the stow. So that can't go to nine Gs either. Just protect the lift fan from structural damage. Um, but those are all integrated fully into the to the flight control laws. Along with the alpha limiters and all the other stuff. Yes. Yes. Fly this in tomorrow. Um, I think a couple of the guys from Loop are flying up. I heard they're coming up um, today or tomorrow or something. Are they going to part of the show? Or uh, I think they're just doing like an arrival show. I know last year they did uh, the the fly at the end. The, 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 I don't know. So. Okay. Sorry, I had to kind of rush through the high office stuff. Um, the bottom line is that NDI did work. It did require, you know, we kind of got into the flight test when I showed the flight test chart. The first impulse was, hey, this is Google. It doesn't it doesn't just completely fall apart. And then we pretty quickly started finding things uh, that had to get fixed, and the schedule got really compressed. So it was actually, uh, when you actually look at the life of the program, the high office development part was actually not very long. It was, it was squeezing in pretty tight. Um, any other questions? Great, thank you for your attention.